with luck. I need my notes to do this for sure. Um, So we're going to make a tracking loop. Um, now I've sort of glossed over a, a bit over phase lock loop tuning. It's a whole subject in itself, and you sort of—I don't know if ever, anyone's ever done any PID control or anything like that, where or proportional interval control. It can be a bit of an effort to actually tune the controller to precisely. It's sort of a, it's, a, it's a compromise between allowing for noise in the signal because there is noise in the signal. Um, so a phase lock loop, if it's too strict, the second the phase jumps in any way, it would have been given up. Um, so you need to give it some slack, but you don't want it to be so slack as to not track the signal very well. So there's a bit of a tuning effort, and I'm not going to go into that. I just happen to have picked some tuning coefficients that work for this. So if you don't mind me glossing over that, because that's like a course in itself otherwise. Um, but yeah, so we'll code this. Um, so... Um, so this is being passed, uh, the satellite number it wants to track, uh, the data, the data stream coming in of, you know, from the ADC and the radio. The initial Doppler which we get from the acquisition loop, so remember that's, that's, the acquisition loop is fairly coarse and we're going to try and home in on it with this and, and follow it. So that's the initial guess of the Doppler which we got from that pretty 3D graph. And there's also going to be an initial guess of the code phase, again which we get from that um, pretty graph. <coughs> And the center frequency, which was three point whatever megahertz it was um, before. Um, we're going to, because we want to get the navigation data out, uh, I'm going to pre allocate um, uh, uh, an array, a list of numbers, which is going to be the navigation data. Um, so I'm just going to fill it with zeros for now. Um, uh, and it's going to be the same length as the, the, the data coming in. Um, uh, but divided by the millisecond by <coughs> millisecond sample length, um, which is 12,000. So in fact, I'm just going to be really naughty and define a global variable. Sorry. Um, so um, we need to first of all generate the CDRM number with that function we defined earlier that generates the, for the relevant satellite. Generate CA code sat ID. So that just makes the, 12, uh, the 1023 bit long thing. And then we've got to stretch it out uh, to the right length depending on our sample rate, um, which I'm assuming is 12 megahertz. Um, so we're just, so that's just going to stretch it to 12,000 long from 1,023 long. Um, initially, uh, the carrier phase. Is, it's not going to know what the carrier phase is initially, so I'll just call it zero. Um, the local oscillator offset is going to be a term we use uh, to feed back into the local oscillator to um, uh, relative to the center frequency, and initially that's our guess at the initial Doppler. Um, the code phase is going to be initialized as the initial code phase again, which we got from the acquisition part. Uh, oh yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, the code. F f uh, this what I'm about to type looks like the kind of thing I would have written at three in the morning and changed my mind about. And but I don't want to risk going against my notes because otherwise I'm lost. So I um, know. Oh, no, no, I think that's okay. I think that's okay. Um, so the, these are basically just initialising a bunch of things we'll need for the feedback loops. We're not using them yet, we're just initialising them. Um, low frick integ integ tone equals uh, init Doppler 2. So um, we, we could, this could be being passed an arbitrary length of data, say a minute's worth or whatever. So we're going to uh, split it up into little chunks of a millisecond, which is what our loop works on. It works on millisecond chunks with all the sort of integration and summing and correlation. So for I, uh, so split into millisecond chunks. Uh, for I in range um, int uh, laser size sample length. 
So that's going to split it into re the relevant chunks. Um, uh, uh, offset equals I. So this is going to find the, the right bit in the uh, data term. The, where it's going to find where we are in the data term for, for which bit uh, which bit of the large amount of data we're analysing this millisecond. So I'm going to call that the bit we're analysing this millisecond. I'm going to call the signal chunk, and it's going to be uh, extracted from this global big um, uh, array of data. So it's going to go from the offset point to the offset point um, plus sample length. So that's just basically making the relevant chunk of 12,000, which is going to loop through that whole length of data. Um, uh, so, um, so the local oscillator frequency is going to be the centre frequency, i.e. the nominal satellite frequency, um, plus the local oscillator offset, which we remember we initialised as the initial, so it's basically the initial Doppler. Um, so it's going to set the local oscillator frequency to the right absolute frequency. Um, Say again? Uh, yes, I do, thank you. Pardon? That one. I've, I think I've done camel case. Oh, you can find it at the start. Oh, thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, dear. Thank you. They always say you lose like 30 IQ points when you're standing up in front of people. Tricky. Um, so, uh, so that's going to be uh, the, the initial offset, isn't it? Uh, so that's basically telling the loop to start looking at this frequency, which is, t is taken from the acquisition algorithm, and then go from there trying to track it. Um, the local i, the local oscillator for i, and the local oscillator for q, and um, because we're trying to track the phase here, we need to know exactly the phase of where we last left off from chunk to chunk so we can hand over to the next chunk so we can start the carrier wave in exactly the same phase. Otherwise it's phase, uh, the phase won't be continuous and that will stop the phase lock loops from actually working. Um, so, uh, is that right? Yeah. Um, sample length. Um, so this is, this is generating the local oscillator. That's all this function does. It makes a, a vector of i and a vector of q, which is the sine wave and the cosine wave of the f frequency you ask it to, and starting at the phase you ask it to. Um, uh, phase off set is equal to uh, carrier phase. Oh yes, which um, which we initialize as zero because you don't know what it is yet. So that's as good as anything else. Yep. I'm so inconsistent, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, what shall I go? I'll fix that one because I'm being camel case, aren't I? Um, uh, so, so now we uh, have to generate the early, late, and prompt pseudo random codes, um, which is easy enough. So the pseudo random number early is going to be equal to uh, this function, which just rolls the <coughs> code phases. Um, that's the global pseudo random number. Uh, uh, so that's uh, so because it's twelve thousand long and there's a thousand bits in it, um, and we want to offset by half. Uh, sorry, there's a thousand chips in it. We want to offset by half a chip. We put it to the right by six, and then uh, we don't actually have to. The PRM prompt, this is sort of redundant, but I'm just going to do it so the code is obvious. So we take the initial pseudo random number and we shift it by um, nothing because it's prompt. And then uh, late is going to be <coughs> PRN code, whoops, uh, PRN. Uh, this is just to make sure, because the rolling function can only take an integer, um, whereas the code phase from the discriminator might be a floating point number, because it's, it's just the tan, uh, it's just, um, it's just, yeah, it's generated by floating point numbers, so we're just making sure we're only rolling by a, a fixed point number. Um, phase minus six, 
So that's half a chip uh, late. Um, and then we're going to um, mix. So now we're mixing down, which is the multiplication with i and q. Um, so now the base band i is equal to the signal chunk, which is the relevant millisecond of data coming that we've got from the analog to digital converter. Um, times by the local oscillator in I phase and the base band Q is equal to the signal chunk times by the local oscillator in the Q phase and I've just dropped back to this diagram just so you can sort of stay, see where we are in the diagram still. So we've just, those two lines I just wrote are just multiplying this incoming signal down by the local oscillator in the I phase so now we've, we've generated the bit going into here and then the key phase is a bit going into here. So the next thing we're going to do is do this early, late, and prompt stuff, and then the um, summing them all together. Um, so um, the early bit is going to be numpy. Um, so that's just a sum function that's very that's faster than ordinary sum for doing. Um, when you know the data is all numbers. It's just a Python thing. So that's going to be the early pseudo random number uh, times by base band i. And then I'm going to copy and paste this a few times and just edit the relevant bits and try not to put any bugs in. What? You've got a lowercase Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five. So, so we're going to have to do the six times for the I branch and the Q branch and early, later and, um, early prompt and late in each one. So now we're doing early prompt is equal to the PRN prompt. And then the late one is equal to the late one. And then uh, that's going to be Q. So it's for the Q, the quadrature branch, early prompt, late, early prompt, late and uh, it's the Q local oscillator we're mixing it with. So all we have just done there is um, do all of these multiplications here and so the numbers we've just generated are this one, uh, the vectors we've just generated, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, which we're then going um, oh, to... No, I just did that, didn't I? I did the summing at the same time. Yeah. So, so we we have now some. Yeah. So these are, yeah. These are the vari what we call the variables. So I E I P I L are the s the scores for the, for how much. Um, yeah. The scores for the early, the prompt, and the late in the I phase, and the scores for the early, the prompt, and the late in the Q phase. So there, what we're going to feed back into the code discriminator. Um. Um. So. Uh, uh, da -da 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 -da. Huh? <laughs> um, no one to push you, not pressure you again. I'm into the last five, ten minutes. That's fine. Yeah, that's okay. Cool. We'll cool. Out by that okay. okay. I'll be, yeah, we're, we're getting close. It's exciting for me. I don't? Yeah, we are going to decode it. We're going to get the navigation bits out. Um, so, code, um, uh, uh, code, this, uh, da -da 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 -da. what am I doing? Yeah, code discriminator. So that is equal to. Um, it's, I'm just. It's just this thing, which is basically a glorified version to deal with the i and the qness. The glorified version of late minus early. That's the late lock loop thing we looked at earlier. So it's, it's just. A, if you were to sit down and stare at this for a while, you'd see that would make sense. It's just doing the same thing as early minus late or late minus early. Um, so, code discrim is equal to uh, early squared plus uh, the Q phase early squared minus the uh, plus the Q early squared. Uh, I'll just break a line. Um, uh, divided by 
No, let's go over here. Divided by um, uh, the early squared plus Q squared plus um, squared plus Q squared. That's the code discriminator. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's fine. Um, and then um, the local oscillator discrimina discriminator, so the carrier frequency discriminator, which tries to find out what the phase error is. Um, uh, that was the tan thing, so that's quite easy. Arc, so the arc tan is the same as tan to the minus one. And that was the Q prompt uh, divided by the I prompt. Um, and then the feedback loop, um, this is the thing that I'm just uh, just sort of going to fudge slightly in that I've already worked out, I've already found, I've already tuned it approximately good enough to get some navigation bits out, I hope. Uh, so basically we're adding uh, what we found out was the code, discrimin uh, the code, the error in where the code was positioned to the code phase term, or the code phase integral term, but um, we have to multiply it down a bit. Um, code phase. Code um, that's code phase integral term. So that's just the phase loop for one of them, and again these numbers are just to do with how you tune it to sort of be a bit lax but be good enough um, instead of blindly following the signal um, completely. And then, um, uh, and then we need to do the uh, feedback loop for the um, uh, for the carrier frequency. So we've just done the code one and now we're doing the, the carrier one. Oh, so this is the filter bit. So this is the phase lock loop basically. This is deciding, taking the error and deciding precisely how to shift this in order to best track the signal. Um, and that's going to look like frequency integral term. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be uh, local oscillation discrim. And the local. So, uh, uh, is that right? Uh, I feel like I should have defined that before. Oh, thank you. No, well, not enough waves, I think. It's local oscillator offset. Is what I'm trying to write, but I just can't. Um, uh, I know. Oh uh, yeah. Um, uh, have I missed any other? Have I spelt it wrong anywhere else? Anyone can see. Okay. Um, it's equal to the local oscillator discriminator output times by twenty uh, plus the local oscillator. Frequency integral term. So, um, all being well. Uh, no, that's. Uh, say again. I think I've just set it in an absolute way rather than adding it. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, have I done it relatively or absolutely? Is the question. Uh, uh, da -da 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 -da. Let me have a look. I've got the diagrams here locally, sort of. Um, no, I think that's right. I think I might have. Um, I've possibly. I, I, I did a prototype run of this code very early in the morning, so I've possibly done absolute tracking and relative tracking in different codes. So, sorry about that. Um, I said I was fudging the whole um, feedback loop thing. So, um, so, finally, remember we're expecting. If all, this loop has worked, then. The navigation, it, it, everything, this whole loop is trying to push the precise replica of the local oscillator and the pseudo random number to be coming out of this one. So this should be 
the navigation data coming out of IP in theory if everything has gone to plan. Um, so uh, remember I pre-allocated an uh, empty thing that we could put the navigation re data results in at the beginning. So for this bit of the loop, and remember I increases every bit of the loop, so it goes up from 0 to whatever, 12,000. It will put the navigation data score in. Um, so I think that function is finished. So now, if we just do um, uh, second of, so we'll track a second of data, which we did earlier. We're going to track stuff like 22. We know from the acquisition what our initial Doppler and um, and um, code phases, um, which I think was, uh, I've written it down in my notes. I think we defined that anyway, I'm pretty sure. I might not have defined that. Um, uh, have I defined it in my notes? No, that is right, I think. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Um, send uh, freak. Yeah, I definitely do want to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in theory, I think this is going <coughs> to almost certainly error, but yeah. Uh, now the second of data not defined. Pardon? It might be smaller. Any second and second, one had a bigger one was smaller. Right, great. I'll just check up here. Uh, yes, you're quite right. Thank you very much. No, code phase is not defined. Um, uh, da, 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 I think I probably put it in my notes from the acquisition because uh, I didn't extract from the acquisition what it was today. Notes. It's 14, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, 3, 8, 5, 7, 8, 4, Anyway, okay, so, so now that's how you get a GPS bitstream. It's really easy, isn't it? And, um, <laughs> and so from there, that is basically just some bits. So you can look up in the, um, in the protocol what all the bits mean, and it's basically just how, where the satellites are in orbit and how you um, can... What, so, for example, there are all sorts of lots and lots of little things, like, for example, the time it takes a signal to get to you is not just the geometric distance between you and the satellite, it's slightly changed by the ionosphere. The ionosphere changes every week, so there's like ionospheric correction factors, and it's just a whole load of bump you can go through the manual and code it up. But the important point is you've got the bitstream out from this thing hidden 15 dBs beneath the noise floor. And so, um, so the rest is easy. So anyway, that's the basics of GPS. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Any questions? Say when you do come out, can you just be a little bit quiet? This is an examining room next door, so. Sure. Yeah. Any questions? Yes, I can put all this up. I'll, uh, this was all in a bit of a rush, so I can type up a much better one and get it. Um, something that we can put on the ECAS website. So, can we do this with payload signals at 15 dB below the noise floor? Yeah. Spread spectrum. This is, this is the, this more general technique is called spread spectrum. So, if you, I mean, you couldn't with an NTX2 because it's limited sort of 20 kilohertz wide, whereas they spread this out to 1 or 2 megahertz wide with this 1.83 megahertz spreading code. Um, but in principle, yeah, for sure. And the nice thing is, because people have to know the specific code in order to find you in the noise, so if they don't know your code, you're basically undetectable. So that's how the M works, as opposed to the CI. Yeah, well, the M just has a much longer code. The M code is like a week long or something. So you have to, they have to acquire the CA code to get the time of the week to know which bit of the M code to look at. Or whatever. Right, right. What sort of level of hardware complexity would you 
Um, you can fit this all. You can fit this all in a moderate FPGA, like a Spartan 3, which is what we've done. And uh, um, we well, can do it. It's basically all the correlation is what is 99% of it, which is an incredibly simple in principle thing. It's just adding loads of numbers, timesing loads of numbers together, and adding them all up. So for average DSP processor. I've not tried, but I would imagine you could. So you know Lawrence on the channel. Of course, you know Lawrence on the channel. He. He, he reckons it could get on an ARM Cortex M4 just about with no overhead, a really simple sort of four or five channel thing. I'm not sure, but it, it, it possibly with a bit of optimization. But certainly if you have an FPGA and just do the correlators in hardware on that, the rest is quite easy. And especially because this is, this is all, we're tracking millisecond to millisecond. You don't, um, you don't really need to do that if you just want to get the bits out and you can accept worse accuracy. Um, so yeah, yeah, there are simplifications to be made. How do you tune the ideal loop? <laughs> <laughs> there are whole books on it. You can sort of, the problem is, so... No, no, not in theory, but in, in this particular case. Oh, well, I, I did try and work it out, but just from the amount of noise bandwidth I was willing to accept. So, so your, your acquisition gives you a guess of the code phase and Doppler. That is a guess. It's fairly coarse. So it has to be good enough it has to be like slack enough to accept that and still, so you can see that it's crap at the beginning, yeah. but it gradually, the filters lock in and you get a much cleaner bitstream out. Once but is it fixed for a particular hardware? Yeah, it's, it, it's fixed for the hardware and the kind of, so there are other ways of using the discriminators I've done. There are several different, there are non-coherent, non-linear discriminators and some people adapt them depending on the signal to noise ratio of the satellite and things like that. So it's completely a function of the whole loop and the hardware. But you need to, you need to do it just once. Yeah, what we've actually done is because I don't really like face-up loops. I've R1, the one I'm working on at work, we've I've rewritten it with Kamen filters, and it's much nicer because they're actually adaptive. They start off being really wide and say I can accept anything, and then they can really reduce the noise bandwidth down and track it much better. I mean, we can get with a GPS receiver, just written in Python, that um, are sort of getting accuracies out of a meter or two with a thousand points per second. So a lot of things like the U-Box will take, because each one of these is like a millisecond of data. This is one second of data that we've got at the bottom. So each of these correlation scores in the nav D arm, the, the, the in-phase prompt arm, is a correlation score after a second. So in theory, you can get a thousand positions a second out of GPS. Now what the things like the U-Boxes do is, because they have these sort of slackish phase up loops and for various other reasons, they just average sort of a hundred of them together and then give you that as your once every or a thousand of them together give you that as your once every second thing. And the accuracy is pretty good if you average a thousand. But if you use much better tracking, you don't have to do nearly as much averaging. And in fact, it's good enough. Whereas uh, things like uh, a conventional GPS might have an error of 50 to 100, 150 meters from one millisecond to the next. The one we've done with Kamen filters is good to three or four meters from one millisecond to the next. So actually you can use every single result in that, but that's sort of another kettle of fish. So does that mean for you, box, if you switched it to 10 hertz, yeah. it's only averaging 100 hertz? I don't know precisely the guts, but in principle, yes, that's how I would do it. Yeah, and I think quite often they're not tracking the whole time because that's quite power intensive. So they only, I think they're only on for sort of 200 milliseconds per second or something often. But yeah, it will depend on the specific ones. Uh, you have the feedback loop to log the loss Is it digital or is it actually pulling to? No, no, it's all. This is all digital. I mean, this is literally. This is done in Python, yeah. And the real thing is digital as well in, in, the, F, in, in the FPGA, except we've got it working. We've got it doing um, 12 channels at 1,000 things per second on a Core i7. So you could put it on a little PC-104 board with a Core i7. Have and have this demo. Demo. I know, but I, I haven't had a chance to look at this for several months because we've got a million other things. But one day we'll get there. Um, yeah. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other things you can do as well. Like a lot of the satellites transmit a different uh, frequency from the same clock. Uh, 1.2 gigahertz now, it's called the L2 band. And in theory, you can therefore measure the electrical path length between you and the satellite, which cancels, you can get rid of the ionospheric fudges, so you can bring the accuracy right down to centimeters that way, which is something I'd like to do at some point. There's a whole bunch, this is a very, very basic GPS receiver that we've just done here. Um, and there are, yeah, there's a lot of scope for doing smarter things if you want to and playing around. So that's the goal for this parachute drop. Very, very small. Obviously. Yes, through someone's rear window. someone's <laughs> 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 head. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cool.